Okay, so um, I'm equally nervous, um, so you should have pity on me. Um, so I'm Mike Klinkowski, and I'm a molecular biologist, and I'm also co-director of our math science uh, teacher certification program at CU. So my interests in learning are actually quite practical. I'm interested in getting students to understand the basics for biology. Um, and I like to make a point that I think hasn't been made before, is that learning non-trivial things is Socratic. So there's very little high tech when it comes to Socrates, except for avoiding the hemlock. And what happens often is that the, ver the fact that most scientific ideas are extremely counterintuitive and difficult to understand is not emphasized. And so in the absence of emphasizing that, you can, expect, you can act as if just telling students something means that they should learn it and know it, and that can make people feel stupid. And often that's one of the major drivers of people out of STEM fields. The alternative is to trivialize those ideas. And that often also happens in the educational arena. Um, most educational materials, in fact, are almost Pavlovian in the sense that they're designed to provoke a response from the student where the student recognizes the answer and returns it to the instructor, as opposed to taking the knowledge that they have and being able to apply it to new situations. Because that takes a lot of confidence that what you know is real and applicable. Um, what we're gonna do is talk to you about two projects. Both are what we would call intelligently designed curriculum, um, quite different from most textbooks. Uh, and one is an introductory chemistry series called Chemistry, Life, the Universe, and Everything. And the other is Biofundamentals, which is, which is introductory cell, molecular, and evolutionary biology. Thank you. And my name is Melanie Cooper, and I'm a chemistry, at, uh, I'm a chemistry professor at Clemson University. Uh, so I've been involved in the CLUE project, and what I want to talk to you today is some, about some of the things that we've been embedding into the curriculum development project as we go along. And um, I want to talk for a, just a minute about the elephant in the room, and that is that computer interfaces are actually quite rigid and non-intuitive, and many of the things that we design for instruction actually impose a barrier to student learning. Uh, and, and there's a good reason why Jim over there is standing uh, with a whiteboard and a marker rather than a computer. And one of the reasons is that it's difficult to represent your ideas on a computer, particularly for some areas of science. It may, for computer programming or math, maybe so. But for, for chemists and biologists, it's actually quite difficult. So um, we, uh, the, the first project that I want to talk about is this Be Socratic project, which is a, um, a free form, uh, a system designed to allow students to draw, and we capture their drawings. Uh, we can, they can draw graphs, they can draw simple structures, they can gesture, they can, uh, they can do a, a number of things. It's not a completely, uh, obviously, uh, easy system. Uh, we, we can't recognize everything, but what I'd like to do is just to show you a few examples of the kinds of things that we can do. So here is um, uh, a kind of odd thing. You may think, well, what's this? Well, uh, what we're asking students to do is to draw a graph of what happens to the potential energy as things interact. And uh, you, what you're going to see is uh, two different activities. The first, in the first one, the student first gets the activity wrong. The, the system recognizes it and will present the student with some ideas, some feedback, and they're asked to reflect on it. They're asked to think about what they're doing. They then proceed to do the activity again, and again are asked to reflect on it, this idea of a Socratic interaction. And then the third activity, the, the, the third thing you'll see is the student drawing is an extension of the activity. So let's go. And here's the, uh, the first go at the graph. And you can see, there we go. Uh, and they're, they're asked, well, 
you know, what do you think should happen? Think again. And the student can try again. And, and this is, in fact, the correct answer. But we're not going to just let them get away with getting the correct answer. They're, they're, yes, that's better. But uh, why does it do that? They're asked about that. And then here's the third, the, the third drawing, uh, which is an extension of the activity. They can change their graph and, and fix it however they want and check again. And again, they're, they're given some feedback and they're asked to reflect on it. So we've, we've collected this data, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but what's important is that we, we're, not, we're, asking them, we're asking them to construct this representation. We're not asking them to recognize the representation, which is a very different thing. Um, and I think you'll find that as we go forward, this idea of student constructing models, because that's what this is, this is a model of how things interact, is going to become more and more important. Uh, I'm on the leadership writing team for the Next Generation Science Standards, and I'm sure you all saw in the NRC framework that modeling is, a very, is a, an important science practice, constructing representations, and we can't do this uh, very easily on an interface that doesn't allow direct input either with a pen or, whoops, back, let's go back, with, uh, with a uh, finger on an iPad. And one of the things that we're finding that we're, uh, is quite interesting is this idea that we can, um, we can uh, recognize gestures, for example. So uh, we heard about embodied cognition earlier, but gesture is also a, a, a really hot topic right now. Gesturing helps you learn. Uh, and we find that, for example, we can recognize as students in interact with their hand on the iPad, we f we're finding differences than if they interact with their finger. Um, the authoring s system and the authoring tools are uh, relatively simple. What we've tried to do is to hit the sweet spot uh, between uh, a very, very powerful system, which the instructor or the user can't interact with uh, because it's very difficult to make activities, and one in which we can um, uh, author our activities relatively easily. So what we, what we have here, I'm going to press the wrong button. Uh, what we have here are different authoring tools. Some of them are, are relatively common. Uh, this one is a structure, a chemical structure recognition. And what I'm going to show you here is the uh, graph one. And um, here is the interface. And it's, real, it's really a very simple interface. This, uh, all the author needs to do is to uh, choose which modules, and they can mix and match on the screen, on the system. Uh, choose whether they, how they want it to look. Choose what text they want to put in. And then when they're ready, they can input the set of rules. Uh, and this is actually the set of rules to um, recognize, I'm sorry, it's blurry, but uh, to, to recognize the, the, actually that potential energy graph that we saw earlier. And I just want to say that uh, you may think, well, that's a weird activity. Why on earth would you have students do that? And the point is that that idea about what happens when things interact is incredibly difficult. Uh, it's one of those things that students can go all the way through college and never understand. They can play fold it all right. They can minimize, uh, they can find the best uh, configuration for a protein, but they don't understand that what they're doing is minimizing the uh, electrical field energy uh, to, it, to get that system into the lowest energy system. So we, this, this actually was a very important and very complex and counterintuitive idea. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so now the question is, what about textbooks? We seem to be uh, have them on top of our heads. People use them. They cost a lot of money. Often, a major problem with them, and the one that I was frustrated with very early, is the idea of getting students to actually read them before they come to class. And in this context, we've collaborated with a company called Highlighter.com that's made a very nice tool. And the way this tool works is that you can put text up on the web, now as PDFs or as HTML, 
and students can be assigned to groups within a class, and they can actually highlight the text and leave comments and see each other's comments in the group and interact back and forth with them. And because we can track compliance of whether students have read it, we've now changed the sort of the entire dynamic of the classroom experience because I can now go in actually and know that they've read the material. So we no longer go and read the textbook back to the student, which is a common approach. And what you can see is, this is an example where, looking at one of the highlights, we can see the entire social, the structure back and forth of how they're interacting with it. This gives the instructor a heads up if they're going in, here's a problematic idea, here's, a, here's an easy idea, we don't have to think about it very hard. And there's a lot of data mining that can be seen here. There's a trivial one, which is compliance. Students have read it before. There's a more complex one, which is the nature of their answers. Um, and so we generate huge amounts of data from both B Socratic and Highlighter, and the question is what to do with it. Um, I'll show you one uh, idea of a rubric that we're using, which is designed to address the fact that students often say whatever they can recognize in their minds and, down, and do a core dump of everything that they know. And so we now encode uh, and analyze student responses based on whether the response has correct, how many correct things it's saying, how many things are totally irrelevant, how many things are wrong. And this gives us essentially a vector plot of where they are at a particular place. I mean, our goal, of course, is to get to, get to uh, this place where they're only, they're, act, they're, they're talking like experts, which is you say what's important and you don't say trivia. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, approach that we're taking to this problem about, this is the high end use of the data from the uh, highlighter, which we, allows us to actually evolve the text, because we can identify those parts of the text that are problematic. And I think <laughs> this is you. It's me. To finish up, we're going to be on time. Uh, so I just want to say, again, we, we have a huge amount of data. Uh, we have all the textual data. We also have the graphical and pr time progression data as students move through all these activities. So they're doing highlighter activities, they're doing be Socratic activities, which are tightly integrated into the text. So we're looking at all the kinds of um, data mining that we were just talked about. Uh, we're doing hidden Markov modeling. We're looking at, can we intervene? Can we see when students are gaming? Can we prompt them? Can we help them? Uh, and can we provide both instructors and students with useful feedback uh, besides the, the metacognitive prompts that are uh, in the system. And we believe, we believe the end result will be this, uh, this kind of meaningful formative assessment. We have some very, very encouraging data from our CLUE um, chemistry course uh, that um, we'll be glad to talk to you with about after. Uh, we, we want that text to evolve. We want students to read it. We want our students to be engaged and we want them to engage in real learning. <coughs> And we'd like to thank you for your attention, NSF and our students. Thank you. <laughs>